we begin with our gathering hymn, uh, I invite those who would uh, like to do so to stand and join in song. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. I invite you to be seated. Uh, welcome to worship. Uh, these words jump out to me in the song we just sang. Uh, it, it says indeed that you are the new reign, or the new kingdom of God built on rock, where justice and truth are at home. Uh, we gather to listen to God's word and indeed to be gathered up uh, built on a sure foundation that we might be God's justice, a place where justice and truth are at home. Uh, we continue with the Kyrie.
Let us pray. Almighty God, thank you for planting the seed of your word. By your Holy Spirit, help us receive it with joy and grow in faith, truth, hope, and love. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of Ephesians. Blessed be the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good measure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace he, that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of this will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people to the praise of his glory. Word of God, word of life. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Please stand. Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Lord. King Herod heard the stories of the disciples casting out demons and healing, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying John the baptizer had been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in him. But others said, It is Elijah. And others said, It is a prophet, like the one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I deheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not, for, John, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and the leaders of Galilee. When his da daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests, and the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, Whatever you ask, I will give you, even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What should I ask for? She replied, The head of John the baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the baptizer on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and, the, and his guests, he did not re want to refuse her. 
Immediately the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, you Christ. Christ. Grace and peace to you from the God who so loved the world that he gave his only son so that all who find faith in him might not die but live. Immediately, the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. And he went and beheaded John in the prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. The swift and brutal end of John's life is a shock each and every time I read it. Makes me wonder why the gospel writer includes it. With John, there is so much build up in the gospel stories. Even before his birth, we get an encounter with John in utero. As Mary, who is pregnant with Jesus, approaches the pregnant belly of John's mother, he kicks for joy in her womb. We know little John before he is even born. A little later in the gospel stories, John suddenly appears in the wilderness eating locusts and wild honey and wearing camel skin clothing. He is wild and he is strong and he fulfills the ancient words of the prophet Isaiah. John is the one who will prepare the way of the Lord. John will make his paths straight. Soon John is revealed to be the baptizer. The baptizer not only of the masses, but of Jesus himself. John is the one to plunge God's own son beneath the waters of the Jordan River and to raise him up as God's holy and beloved child, the one with whom God is so very pleased. John is a mighty prophet. John's reputation is so strong that powerful men like King Herod fear him. And after he is dead, they believe that Jesus might actually be John in resurrected form. But John's end, John's death, is unexpectedly swift and it is brutal. Like something from an episode of Game of Thrones, a hero in the gospel stories is discarded without warning and without honor. John dies at the whim of an evil woman and her wicked child. The order is given and minutes later, John's lifeless head is served on a platter. Why do the Gospels include this gruesome tale? And why is the character of John the Baptist killed off when the story of the Gospels has only just begun? In the gospel story, John's death foreshadows the death of Jesus himself. Jesus' death on a cross of a brutal and violent death to come. King Herod fears that Jesus is the resurrected John, come back to haunt him. And Herod doesn't quite get the details right, but in truth he is not far off. Jesus will be resurrected. Not even death will be able to stop him. And because of Jesus, death will not be the final word for John either. The promise of resurrection revealed on an Easter morning to come will cover John's savaged body too. 
paraphrasing the words of a pastor, an abolitionist named Theodore Parker, Martin Luther King Jr. once said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Faced with the wickedness of tyrants and the seemingly endless evil of racism in American history, Dr. King is clinging to this promise, same promise that John the Baptist and Jesus proclaimed. He is saying that the violence and despair of the moment blinds us from seeing a much bigger truth, a cosmic truth. Sorrow may last for many nights, but joy will most certainly come. It will be resurrected on an Easter morning. The beheading of John the Baptist and the assassination of Dr. King, they speak this same truth. The world is full of tyrants. Violence and death are real, and they threaten our faith in the goodness of this world that God has made. And in the face of tyrants and abusers, these prophets urge us to keep the faith. Hold fast to the belief that the immovable stones of present injustice will in time be worn to dust by God's irrepressible love. To see the world in this way and to steadily work for justice, we must see change not just in the moment, but from a cosmic perspective. We must take our present actions and experiences and place them in this long context. This context of the long arc of the moral universe. The immediacy of beheadings and crucifixions, these terrors in the time of John the Baptist and Jesus, made that long view difficult to see. Given a narrow view of time, People like Herod and Pilate and temple leaders and imperial authorities made the words and actions of Jesus and of his followers look very small, look insignificant. But given that long view, history tells us that the reverse is true. The tyrants fall on their own swords. Those mighty empires crumble to dust. Jesus is shown to be the one who's actually aligned with the long arc of the moral universe. Not even death can overcome the unfailing love of our God. Death is the ultimate enemy. That fearsome opponent that awaits us at the end of all our earthly days. But this is not just about what happens in the end. This story, after all, is given very early in the gospel stories. It's given like a cold splash of water. It's given early on to teach us that this mission that we are baptized into is actually a daily struggle for life over death each and every day. This world is full of tyrants and it is full of tragedies. Like the deaths of George Floyd and the death of Dr. King, the violent death of John the Baptist startled and disturbed the followers of Jesus. It was a traumatic event. Jesus' work, and work of healing and justice had just begun when the news of this frightening beheading began to travel around the countryside when the followers of John and Jesus learned of it. What would these followers of John and Jesus do? Would they run and hide? Would they simply cling to memories of better days when John was alive, when no one was talking about danger and death? We ourselves live in a culture that is both enamored with death, but also terrified by it, all at the same time. Think of how many television shows feature zombies and murders and criminal investigations. And these movies and shows give way to commercials about miracle pills that will save us. About beauty supplies that will keep us looking young and feeling young forever. Our Christian faith proclaims that all who want to follow Jesus, all who want to discover abundant life, 
must turn away from these things and daily face the parts of our lives that are actually dying. Fantasies and nostalgic memories that we cling to will not save us and they won't serve us well in the present. For John the Baptist and for each one of us, salvation comes through learning the way of the cross. And the cross requires honesty. Discipleship is not sugarcoating our failures and our frailties. It is daily confessing our weakness and finding faith in Christ's promise that the arc of the moral universe is long, but they will ultimately bend towards justice. John Hull was a retired professor of religion and theology in Birmingham, England. He was born in Australia in 1935 to a father who was a pastor and to a mother who was a teacher. And from the time he was young, John Hull had an eye condition. Gradually, he developed cataracts in both eyes. And by the time he was in his 40s, John Hull was completely blind in both eyes. Losing one's eyesight is a kind of death experienced by someone who's still living. In an interview recorded before his death, Hull talks about this experience of trans transitioning from a visual world to a world without sight. He says, over time the world became more and more gray until at last there was no light, no visual stimulus of any kind. Following the descent of complete darkness, he found that for a time he was quite bored. There were no longer things to see and think about. There were no waves at the beach to observe or people to see walking by in the sand. This boredom continued until he was at a party one day with his wife. A colleague approached him and said that he felt obliged to tell him that though he couldn't see it, his wife looked particularly beautiful. John Hull was angered by this friend that he described as having the cheek to come up and talk to him about looking at his beautiful wife. And then the friend continued by saying, You know, John, in a way you're lucky. You will always see your wife as she is now. You won't see her age and fade in beauty. What happens next to John Hull makes this a gospel-worthy story. After hearing that he was somehow lucky to cling to a visual memory of his wife's beauty, John Hull made a life-changing decision. He decided that his cheeky friend was wrong. He did not want to live in some dead, nostalgic past. He did not want to interact with his wife or his children or anyone else based on an old, dead memory that was no longer true. He wanted to experience life, life in the present. And for him, the present was no longer something that included sight. And so John Hull decided that he would train himself to no longer depend on his visual memories. Every time an image would pop into his mind, he made the choice to simply push it out of his head. By choice, he trained himself to set aside his visual memories and to focus on the senses that he could still use in the present moment. In time, he says, he forgot what his wife and his children even looked like. He did all of this because he could not bear the thoughts of seeing his wife as she was 10 or 20 years ago. As time goes on, this memory picture would become further and further from the truth. It would be like hiding in a tomb, choosing a dead lie over a living truth. To John Hull, clinging to old images of his loved ones would be choosing death over life. And by willing himself to reject the comfort of these nostalgic images, he was choosing to live in the present moments without sight, but by using sound and smell and touch, he began to experience his loved ones not as they were, but as they are. John Hull's daily choice to put nostalgia to death 
and to live in the present is the way of the cross. He set aside the comforts of the past, not because he wanted to suffer, but because clinging to a lie would only plunge him into a deeper spiritual blindness. His physical sight died, and he chose to accept that. But that death of his sight was not the end. The courage to let go of this world that he had known and to believe in something more, that brought a new world to birth. John Hull discovered life beyond the grave. The story of John the Baptist and the story of John Hull are stories of faith. They are reminders that from the very beginning, Jesus has been at work here in a world of daily tragedy and despair. These things are common. They are all around us. To all who are discouraged by loss, to all who wonder if justice will ever come, this is what the gospel proclaims. God's work in this world is not yet done. God's work in your life is not yet done. Death and loss are fearsome, but these things, they are not final. There is a new world created beyond the one that we have seen and known. Don't cling to a past that is already dead and gone. Open your senses to the God whose works of healing and justice continue all around you. Just like with John the Baptist, death is an early chapter in this gospel story. Death is not the end. There is a resurrection story still to come. Amen.
Let us come before the triune God in prayer. God of truth, put your word of justice on our lips. Bless your church in the task of holy resistance. Make us a living and persistent sign of your righteousness and your loving kindness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of heaven and earth, pour your healing power upon our fragile earth for us and for all who will inherit it. Inspire the work of engineers and environmentalists who seek sustainable sources of energy, food, and clean water. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of justice, call leaders near and far to act with compassion. Speak convicting words of holy judgment to those in positions of authority. Inspire us to open our homes and our lives to all who have been abandoned, rejected, or abused. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of salvation, bring wholeness to all your beloved children. Anoint the hands of all caregivers, nurses, doctors, therapists, hospice workers, and chaplains. Bring peace and healing to those in our community who are suffering. We pause now to offer up the names of all those who need your peace and healing, silently or aloud. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of tenderness, you adopt us as your own. Help us to provide nourishing care for all children in our midst. Inspire us with their creativity and energy. Heal and protect children who are victims of abuse, neglect, or scorn. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We now take time to offer up any other prayers silently or aloud. For what else do the people of God pray? Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of the saints, you have claimed the faithful departed as your own and given them an inheritance and glory. Sustain us in faith until the fullness of time when you, gather us, uh, when you gather up all things in heaven and on earth. Move us to reach out in compassion to all who are grieving the death of a loved one. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your abiding grace. Amen. As God has been generous with us, we too are invited to be generous with this world that God loves. Uh, In July, our cause of the month is our relationship with the Minneapolis Area Synod and the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Um, There are a couple pages in the worship folder that kind of give graphics and lots of information on where our offerings go. Um, We in recent years have really benefited tremendously from our partnerships with the Synod. Um, I'm also aware that this fall we'll be starting a two-year process, this uh, faith practices and neighboring practices program. You'll hear more about that really starting in September. But again, that's a partnership with the Minneapolis Area Synod and with other Lutheran congregations uh, in the Synod. Um, If you designate any cause of the month special gift uh, during the month of July, that will go directly to support uh, uh, Minneapolis Area Synod and the ELCA and all the good things uh, that you see there so well um, explained in the worship folder. Uh, We receive a musical offering.
And my way grows drear, precious Lord, linger near, when my life is almost gone. Hear my cry, hear my call, hold my hand, lest I fall, take my hand, precious Lord. Jesus, bread of life, you have set this table with your very self and called us to the feast of plenty. Gather what has been sown among us and strengthen us in this meal. Make us to be what we receive here, your body for the life of the world. Amen. Gathered in from scattered places, Christ unites us here at God's table of love and mercy. Please join me as we celebrate Holy Communion. The Lord be with you. And also with Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. God of creation, we give you thanks for the wonders of life, the beauty of the world, and the deep and expansive universe of which we are only a small part. We thank you that you have not left us alone in this world. We are blessed with a community of others. We experience your presence in the love we share and in mysterious ways beyond our abilities to comprehend or to put into words. When the time was right, you sent your son Jesus to demonstrate your love in new and radical ways. As we gather around this table to share this meal, we remember the great extent of his selfless love and we give you thanks in humility and in awe. We add our voices to the chorus of history who praise you in a multitude of languages and a multitude of songs, forever singing to the glory of your name. The night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. May these ordinary elements of life, this bread and this cup, be transformed by your presence into the body and blood of Christ, nourishing us with spiritual food and equipping us to be the body of Christ in the world. Filled with your spirit, may we do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with you, loving you with our entire beings and loving others as ourselves. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, 
Let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to take the bread and to eat it, the body of Christ given for you. Amen. I invite you to take the juice or the wine and to drink it, the blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. Jesus, bread of life, we have received from your table more than we could ever ask. As you have nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own life. In your name we pray, amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. I invite you to stand, uh, stay where you're at, but share a word or a sign of God's peace with one another. Choking on Jesus. <laughs> hey, you can Peace. still you can still say it. You can still say it yeah, out loud. We can say it out loud. You don't even have to whisper. It's true. You can bark it. <coughs> Natalie would appreciate it if you said it loud. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Before uh, we receive God's blessing and are sent out, um, just a reminder uh, that uh, the 25th, two Sundays from today, our guest preacher will be Craig Peterson, uh, assistant of the bishop in the Minneapolis Area Synod. Um, And so I invite you to be aware of that as we use that particular day to lift up and celebrate our relationship uh, with the synod and with the wider church. Um, Also invite you to uh, check out our garden. I know Kim isn't here today. Kathy, you're here, right? Like if there's anything ripe over there. Pea pods. Oh, we picked them. I know. Rosie said she ate most of them already. So, <laughs> the pea pods. Okay, there's some in the cup. There's some in the cup. All right. Receive God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.
in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.